Hello everyone, welcome. I am Jet Aguilar from the Astronomical League of the Philippines, and I will be hosting this webinar today. Thank you so much for joining us for our 2024 Astronomy Expert Speaker Series online lecture series, and this is the first one for the new year. I am very happy to see a lot of registrants attending today, uh, and we have about 220 registrants listed now from all over the world, not only the Philippines, the United States, Europe, and other parts of Asia as well. Thank you so much for attending, and I hope you will enjoy today's webinar. And for today, we are so fortunate to have with us, as our speaker, none other than Dr. Michael E. Brown, who will give his talk on the search for Planet Nine. Yes, he's no other than the Dr. Mike Brown, who authored the book, How I Killed Pluto and Why It Had It Coming. This inspiring book is such a joy to read and, highly recommend, and I highly recommend it, not only to all amateur astronomers who had not read it yet, but to all those who are interested in what is out there. My fellow ALP member, Ms. Imelda Joson, will be doing the introduction for our esteemed speaker later. For those who were not able to register, but would still want to watch this ongoing webinar, we are currently live streaming on Facebook at the Facebook page of the Philippine Astronomy Forum where you can watch this webinar live. And before we start, kindly allow me to explain some rules for this webinar to help us make this an enjoyable learning experience for everyone. Kindly listen and do your best to give your undivided attention to the speaker. There will be a short question and answer session at the end of the lecture. You may type in your questions under the Q&A tab found in your Zoom interface at any point during the presentation. We will do our best to read and answer your questions live after the lecture or via the Q&A tab. We would like to remind everyone that the contents presented in this webinar will remain as the individual property of the lecturer and the photographers in the presentation. We will also be distributing certificates of attendance via email to all registered attendees who will be present with us throughout the webinar. So kindly, Use the name you have written in your registration forms to help us facilitate this process. So enjoy the webinar and let us all have fun learning. Here is the program flow, and I would like to turn you over now to Ms. Imelja Joson for the introduction. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to thank everyone who has made this Astronomy Expert Speaker Series a success. In just a few months, in April, we will be on our third year. I'd like to give a very special thank you to all our previous speakers. The late Professor Jay Pasakoff, Zolt LeVay, Joe Rayo, Fred Espinak, Robert Reeves, Dave Eicher, Ken Crawford, Professor Mike Barlow, Scott Roberts, Father Chris Corbley, David Levy, Kelly Beatty, Dan Green, Heidi Hamill, Debbie Elmigreen, Brother Robert Mackey, Brother Guy Consomagno, Hilary Andales, Dr. Valentin Pilet, Wally Pahalka, Robert Nemeroff, and our speaker today, Dr. Michael Brown. They all took time off from their very busy schedules to share with all of us their expertise and passion in the field of astronomy. When Edwin and I started this project in collaboration with the Astronomical League of the Philippines, our goal is to give people from all walks of life and from every corner of the world the opportunity to hear for free from the scientists themselves about their respective fields of research and expertise. We have made it so accessible to attend, even from the comforts of people's home and offices via Zoom and Facebook Live, and we even upload it to YouTube later on. Our hope is that this speaker series will enlighten us awaken our curiosities, and inspire the future generation of students, scientists, 
engineers, policymakers, and philanthropists who can support and fund ongoing and future research. Expanding our knowledge and understanding of the world we live in truly gives us a better insight and appreciation of our very own lives and our place within this universe. But this speaker series will not be possible if not for a handful of hardworking and dedicated people who work tirelessly behind the scene. They are our host, Dr. Jet Aguilar, who not only prepares the beautiful posters and is our moderator, but he single-handedly takes care of the Zoom subscription for this project. Mr. James Kevin T., the president of the Astronomical League of the Philippines, June Lau and Eric Africa, working remotely from Ohio, Peter Tobalinal, Henrik Cole T., and Andrew and Justine Chan, all from the Philippines. Both Edwin and I, along with the officers and members of the Astronomical League of the Philippines, hope that you will again join us in future talks and invite your family, friends, and colleagues to partake in this outreach program that we humbly started two years ago. Dr. Michael Brown is a 22nd guest lecturer in our Astronomy Expert Speaker Series. Edwin and I first met Mike at the winter meeting of the American Astronomical Society in 2013 in Long Beach, California. I had a mixed feeling when Edwin first introduced Mike, or first introduced me to Mike, the Pluto killer. You see, Edwin and I were close friends with the late Pluto discoverer, Clyde Tumbo. We first met Clyde and his wife, Patsy, in 1989, when we visited their home in Las Cruces, New Mexico. From then on, we corresponded regularly with Clyde until he passed away in 1997. So we were disappointed then to hear about the IAU's decision in 2006 to downgrade Pluto's status from a major planet to a dwarf planet. However, we realized that as astronomy advances and evolves, and as new findings and discoveries come to light, we must continue to revise and update our view and understanding of our solar system. So, no hard feelings, Mike. Mike scans the sky searching for and intensely studying distant bodies in our solar system in the hope of gaining insight into how our planet and the planets around it came to be. In his quest, he has discovered dozens of dwarf planets, including Eris, Sedna, Quayuar, and Makimaki. These discoveries led to the demotion of Pluto from a planet to a dwarf planet in 2006. Mike is currently hot on the trail of Planet 9, a hypothesized body that is possibly the fifth largest planet of our solar system. Mike is a professor of planetary astronomy at the California Institute of Technology, or Caltech, since 1996. He has authored more than 150 scientific papers. He has also won many awards and honors, including the Yuri Prize from the American Astronomical Society's Division of Planetary Sciences, a Presidential Early Career Award, a Sloan Fellowship, and the 2012 Cavalier Prize in Astrophysics. He was inducted into the U.S. National Academy of Sciences in 2014. Mike has been featured in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Los Angeles Times, and Discover Magazine. He was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in 2006. Mike is the author of how I Killed Pluto and Why It Had It Coming, an award-winning best-selling memoir of the discoveries leading to the, to the demotion of Pluto. His articles have been published in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, 
and astronomy magazines, to name a few. Mike received his AB from Princeton University in 1987, and then his master's and PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, in 1990 and 1994, respectively. In 2002, the International Astronomical Union named asteroid 1998 HQ51 as 11714 Mike Brown in his honor. Friends, let us give a warm welcome to Professor Mike Brown. Thanks so much. It's a it's it's a great pleasure to be here and to see so many people um, out here on I you know it's it's an evening for me. It's a morning for you. It's whoever it, whatever time it is for wherever everybody is around the world. Um, but it's great to all be here to be talking about these really amazing discoveries uh, in in the outer solar system. And and what I want to talk about today is our quest to find a new ninth planet in our own solar system. But before I do that, I really want to take you back to think about the discoveries of planets in, in our solar system. And I want to take you back to a year that I think of as a, as, a, as a critical year in our solar system, and that is the year 1780. If, if it were 1780, you could go out at night, you could look up at the sky, and you could see all the planets. Jupiter is easy, Saturn is usually pretty easy. Venus is hard to miss, Mars very red, even even Mercury if you know where to look low in the sky. And 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 that was it. That was all of the planets. There were no planets known beyond Saturn. And I, and I've I've tried to actually go back and look at things that were written in that period. And as far as I can tell, and it's I'm not a historian, so I'm sure I've missed something here somewhere, but as far as I can tell, there was not widespread speculation that there were more planets beyond Saturn. The telescope was now being widely used and people knew that there were stars that had never been seen before and that you could see things like, like moons of Jupiter that had never been seen before. But it seems to have been too much of a leap for people to think, oh yeah, maybe there are planets out there still to be found. And so it was a surprise when when um, William Herschel in 1781 had he had just constructed what was really the best telescope on the planet and and best in the sense that it made the the crispest images. So instead of having big blurred stars like everybody else, he had tiny little dots where the stars could be. And and in 1781 he was he was mapping out the stars of the Milky Way trying to understand the structure of the Milky Way. And he would go to a patch of the sky and make a map, literally write, you know, show, uh, write down where the stars were. And he got to this one part and he saw something that didn't look like a star. Instead of being a nice point of light, it was, it was fuzzy. And that's okay. There are many things in the sky that are fuzzy. There are things that we now know as galaxies, planetary nebulae. They didn't quite know what they were at the time, but they knew they existed. So he wasn't immediately startled to find something fuzzy, but he, but he was a careful observer. And one of the things he did is go back the next night and check all of the observations that he had made. He checked that the stars were all in the right place and he checked for this fuzzy thing and the fuzzy thing had moved. If it moves, he knew, we all know, immediately it's part of the solar system. All the stars, all the galaxies that are very far away are in the same spot relative to each other night after night after night. Anything in the solar system, though, moves either slowly or quickly across the sky. And this particular one was moving very slowly. It was moving so slowly that, uh, that Herschel immediately knew that it was beyond the orbit of Saturn. And, and you might think that, okay, you just found something beyond Saturn and it's big and fuzzy. It must, it must be a planet and everybody would agree. But even Herschel at the time did not jump to the conclusion that it was a planet. It could be a couple things. It could be people knew about comets and they knew they were on very eccentric orbits. And maybe this was just a comet outside the orbit of Saturn and on its way in. Or or maybe, maybe there was something else going on that they, they didn't know about. 
it it took him some convincing to finally declare that he had found a planet, which is which is pretty funny. Usually, would think someone found a planet and they would be jumping up and down saying they found a planet. Um, took some convincing, but he finally was convinced maybe this really is a planet. And um, of course, if you find a planet, you get to name it. He he proposed the name George. Uh, that name didn't stick for very long. It was George was after King George and and the French in particular were not excited about naming a new planet after King George. And so the name didn't stick for very long and there, there were a lot of discussion about the name, but it was still difficult to know if this really was a planet. Did it really have a circular orbit like a planet did? Or, or maybe it still might've been a comet or something else weird that, that was on an orbit that was gonna be eventually coming into the inner part of the solar system. And this, this question, it was difficult to answer with just a few years of observation out of a long orbit of, of this new planet. But this question was really laid to rest by um, a French astronomer, uh, Alexis Bouvard, who wrote this very exciting sounding book of tables of Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus. And it, it indeed is a table, a, a book full of tables of Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus. And it's full of tables and also of equations. The equations were Alexis Bouvard was looking at the position of Saturn and of Jupiter and looking at the position of Uranus and trying to predict where Uranus should be. So Uranus doesn't just go around in its its nice elliptical orb around the sun. It's influenced by the gravitational pull of Jupiter and Saturn. And to really predict where Uranus is supposed to be, you need to be able to predict that gravitational pull. And to predict that gravitational pull, you have to see how Jupiter and Saturn are interacting with each other. And so it's a complicated system to really be able to predict where Uranus is. But Bouvard worked it out with these, these equations um, that are really just showing you the interactions between all these objects. And he has this table, which is a fascinating table. This is a table of the position of Uranus as a function of time. Let me zoom in on this table for you. And you can see, here's the date of discovery, 1781. And the most fascinating thing about this table to begin with is it goes backwards in time. Uranus was discovered in 1781, but here are positions of Uranus, observed positions of Uranus all the way back to 1690. Uranus was observed the first time uh, the known observation of Uranus was with a telescope in 1690 by an astronomer who was doing just like Herschel. He was calculating, he was cataloging the positions of the stars in the sky, but he missed that crucial step that Herschel did, which was to go back the next night and look again. So in 1690, Uranus was found, but it was cataloged as a star. In 1712, Uranus was found, but it was cataloged as a star. It happened in about a dozen times until 1781, Uranus had been observed and cataloged as a star. Bouvard realized this by going back to these old catalogs. And he went, he went first went from 1781 back a decade. He found a catalog and he looked around for the region of the sky where approximately where Uranus should be. And he found a star that wasn't where it was supposed to be. And he took that star and he said, okay, if that's Uranus, I can predict the orbit backwards in time a few more years. And he found it in 1769 and finally all the way back 90 years going backwards in time. It was, it was a brilliant insight to realize that he could find this. Once Uranus was discovered, of course, it was observed many times. And so there was, it was easy to see the positions of Uranus in all these times. And what Bouvard did is took his theory, his, his calculations of where Uranus should be, and he compared it to the real observations. And that's what these pluses and these minuses are. Sometimes Uranus was a little bit ahead of its position where it was predicted. Sometimes a little behind, ahead, behind, behind for a long time, finally ahead again. And Bouvard, who you would you would describe, certainly he would describe as, as the preeminent astronomer of his age, um, is just like people who I also know now who would who would probably describe themselves as preeminent astronomers of their age. And when Bouvard looked at these, these data and he looked at his theory and there was a discrepancy, Bouvard said, clearly my theory is perfect. The data must be wrong. Astronomers need to make better observations.
And so the astronomers, feeling very chastised, went back, continued to make observations. I apologize for my cat. This is my cat whose tail is now in the middle here. Come on, go back there. Um, he said, make these better observations. Astronomers went to make better observations from about 1820, when this book was published, till about 1840, another 20 years of now very careful observations. And Uranus was still not where it was supposed to be. It was ahead. It went back behind again. And by about 1840, it was widely accepted that the reason that Uranus was not where it was supposed to be was because instead there must be another planet that's pulling it along in its orbit. Just like Jupiter and Saturn tug it from one direction, there must be another planet out there that's sometimes pulling it a little bit faster, sometimes pulling it a little bit slower. People generally accepted this, this must be true, but nobody knew how to find it. Everybody knew there was a planet out there somewhere. Nobody knew how to find it. All of this um, was, was a big problem until 1846, when another astronomer also at the observatory in Paris, Urbain Le Verrier, used these very data, plus the, the more recent observations, to construct a mathematical theory of where this new planet should be, and he predicted a location in the sky. He immediately sent the, this location to the observatory in Berlin, and the observatory in Berlin opened up the, the telescope that very night and found it right there, found basically the planet Neptune, the very first night of observation. And I have to say that to this day, this remains to me one of the most amazing stories of, of prediction um, and of, 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 a, of a discrepancy and then a prediction to fix it. And then a, a discovery um, perfect for this prediction. And I really think this is one of the moments when I, I I like to think that modern physics really uh, began in a certain way, in the sense that you know everybody understood that gravity worked and you could explain planets by the gravity and everything else. But I I'm not convinced that people really believed that you could use this newfangled physics to predict something like the existence of a new planet. And then and suddenly Le Verrier proves that you can find a new planet just by doing calculations. It's an amazing moment. It's such an amazing moment that he became, not surprisingly, incredibly famous very quickly. He was he was described as the, the astronomer who found a planet with the tip of his pencil. Um, he uh, he has, a, has a statue of him in Paris facing north up one of the grand boulevards. He, uh, he has one of, one of only, I think, 50 or 60 people whose name was officially inscribed in the Eiffel Tower. You know, so other astronomers realized that finding planets can get you very famous. And so they said, you know what? I want to go do this too. So immediately after uh, Le Verrier found this planet, other astronomers started predicting the existence of a new planet. It started, I mean, really almost within within months after after Neptune, new planets were being predicted. And the most famous of these new planet predictions, of course, is, is the one we all know about, which is Percival Lowell, an American astronomer from, from Boston, predicted the existence of what he called Planet X beyond the orbit of Neptune. The reason he was predicting the existence of Planet X was because even once you included Neptune, he was convinced that the orbit of your, that Uranus was still not quite in the right position. Neptune was not quite in the right position. And so you needed another fifth giant planet just beyond the orbit of Neptune to explain the perturbations to that. And, and to go find this, he did a couple of things. The first thing he did was um, he made predictions of where in the sky it should be. And he sent a team of astronomers to Mount Wilson. Mount Wilson is 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 only about uh, three miles that direction, although quite a bit up. If you if you go out my door, um, maybe it's about five miles. You can get up to Mount Wilson. He sent a team up to Mount Wilson before the observatory was there, but he sent a team with telescopes to look at his predicted spot in the sky for this new planet. And he took a picture that looked pretty much like this. And there it is. Do, do you guys see it? See the planet? Anybody? Anybody? No? No planets. Well, 
Clyde Tom, uh, uh, Percival Lowell, sorry, Percival Lowell didn't see the planet either. And he, he, he was disappointed because he was looking for something the size of Jupiter. And that would have been big and bright in the screen. And he didn't see it. And they took big photographic plates looking everywhere. Didn't see it. Went back to the drawing board, eventually founded the Lowell Observatory in, in Flagstaff, whose one of its main missions, reasons to, for existence was to look for this new planet. And to find this new planet, um, they they hired Clyde Tombow off the, the farm in Illinois. And Clyde Tombow got to the observatory with tasks to find this planet that was predicted. And he took pictures like this and he realized he didn't know what a planet looked like. How 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 can you tell what's a planet and what's just a star? But he he was smart enough to know that just like Herschel, if you take a picture one night and you take a picture the next night, you see it move. Anybody see it move? No, you didn't see it move. Let's look again. Here's the first night. Here's the second night. Anybody? Anybody? No, no, you didn't. Let's try one more time. Is it there? Did you find it? Um, Clyde Tombaugh found it. There it is. One night. There it is. The next night. These are the discovery images of Pluto from 1930. And... Um, when, when Clyde Tombaugh found it, just like when Herschel found Uranus, he saw it, he saw that it was moving very slowly across the sky and you could immediately realize that this is, this is exceedingly far away, further away than Neptune, the most distant thing anybody had ever seen in, in the solar system. And so after studying it for a little bit, the, the headlines uh, were, were blaring. Um, this is the headlines in the New York Times uh, from, the, from the announcement of the discovery. Ninth planet discovered on the edge of the solar system, first found in 84 years. So far, so good. Lies far beyond Neptune. Yes, still true. Sighted January 21st after 25 year search. That The beginning of that search was when he was up there on uh, Mount Wilson. Seen at Flagstaff, Arizona, spotted through a special photo telescope. All true, so far, so good. The sphere possibly larger than Jupiter. Oh, possibly larger than Jupiter and 4 billion miles away, meets predictions. This is actually where the problem with Pluto actually starts. And it happens because it meets predictions. There was a prediction from Percival Lowell that there was a planet possibly larger than Jupiter just beyond Neptune that was tugging on the orbit of Neptune. If you have a prediction, this is, this is the way science can often lead itself astray. Um, you have a prediction, you find something. Clearly that something must be the thing that you predicted. The nice thing about science is it can be led astray like this, but science is generally self-correcting. But but I just want to point out at the time, this possibly larger than Jupiter is, is wrong by a factor of 250,000 in mass. This is the, the main reason that Pluto started being called a planet right away is because it was a planet. If this thing was actually possibly larger than Jupiter, everybody would call this a planet. They would call it a planet today, but this is wrong by a factor of 250,000. How, how wrong that's in, in mass. Let's, let's, let's look again. There it is. Uh, I always lose it. It's that little thing right there. I think there it goes. Yeah, there it goes down there. It's, it's really quite a small little blip in the sky. And even, even Clyde Tombaugh was a little suspicious um, that this, that he, he was not convinced that this was the thing that Percival Lowell had predicted because he could see it and he could tell that it was not possibly larger than Jupiter. So he actually spent uh, a good, another decade continuing to search the skies for something else bigger and, and never found anything bigger because in this region of the solar system, there are no planets possibly larger than Jupiter. Let's let's look to see what there really is. Here is the picture of the solar system that, that I like to give, which is a very different one than you'll often see in, I don't know, your 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 daughter's lunchbox that she takes to school or a placemat or a poster on a wall or something. They always like to show planets slight, you know, more or less the same size. Sure, Mercury's a little smaller than Jupiter, but they're all more or less the same size. You you almost never see a picture like this where you see planets all at their actual sizes. So here are the planets. Here's Jupiter in the background. 
Um, Saturn, even without its rings, it's quite big. Um, Uranus and Neptune, really quite gigantic planets. And then the, the inner terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And you can even see in this slide uh, the asteroids, the biggest asteroids, the asteroids that are big enough to be more than one PowerPoint pixel. Um, they're a series. It's actually two pixels across. Very exciting. Um, the other ones are smaller, but there are about 10 that are big enough that they would appear on this one thing. And you know, you can you can quite easily see that the the terrestrial planets are quite different from the giant planets, are quite different from from the asteroids in, in size and stature. And now I want I want to put Pluto on here. It's funny because um the, the 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 how small Pluto really is is often lost in that debate that happened almost 20 years ago now about whether Pluto should be a planet, but it really is a tiny little thing. There it is on the edge of the solar system. And you know, if you if you blink, you miss it. Whoops, there I blinked and I just missed it. I didn't want to do that yet. Hold on. There we go. It's it is, you know, if you were to if you were to make a pattern of a big planet, slightly smaller, slightly smaller, slightly smaller. This would not be the next one in 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 your pattern. It didn't really make sense at the time, but at the time, well, at the time it was possibly larger than Jupiter. That would be a big planet out there. But it was very quickly it it was realized that it was increasingly smaller and smaller and smaller until it was finally realized it was that big. But it was the only thing out there, and it, it was sure it was an oddball at the edge of the solar system. But there was kind of nothing else to really call it. And let me just show you how odd it really was. Here are the orbits of the planets, giant planets now, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And I'll, I'll remind you that Pluto is on this elliptical orbit. It goes inside the orbit of Neptune. It comes much further outside. It really didn't fit the pattern of the planets at all. But again, there was nothing else out there. There was really nothing else to call it. So it stayed a planet in good standing for about 62 years. 62 years later, though, the first new object was found beyond the orbit of Neptune. And, and at that point, the floodgates basically just opened. As of today, I actually haven't looked recently what the latest count is, but it's something like 4,000 objects are now known in orbit beyond Neptune, some of them beyond Neptune, some of them inside the orbit of Neptune. And if you look at their orbits, they look like a bird's nest of orbits tilted this way and tilted that way and, and tilted every direction. And, and uh, even more intriguingly, if you look at their orbits, not edge on, but you look at them face on, you realize that just like Pluto, some of them go inside the orbit of Neptune, some of them go much more eccentric outside the orbit of Neptune. And whatever you thought of Pluto before, it is very clearly part of this population of what we now call the Kuiper Belt. And and uh, this is this is the 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 main reason why it's become very clear that there is a population of things we would call terrestrial planets, population of things we call giant planets, population of things we called asteroids, and Pluto is part of this population of things that we call the Kuiper Belt. For since the discovery of, of that Kuiper Belt, um, we, we could use that just like people had been using Uranus and Neptune and Jupiter and Saturn for years, looking at the perturbations of those orbits to try to find new objects beyond Neptune. By this point, it was known that that uh, Uranus and Neptune, contrary to what, what um, Percival Lowell had thought, Uranus and Neptune actually were not in the wrong positions. They were, they were exactly where the theory predicted them to be. The gravitational perturbations from Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune put them all exactly where they were supposed to be. All of the planets were there where they're supposed to be. All of the objects in the Kuiper Belt were where they were supposed to be. Basically, by this time, by about 2002, everything in the solar system made sense. We could we could predict the orbits of all the planets, all the Kuiper Belt objects. We did not need to invoke anything else um, out there. We knew that that uh, Planet X, that Percival Lowell had had thought was there, was not really there. This got ruined a little bit by by me mostly. I'm sorry. In in 2003, with the discovery of this this first of these very strange objects that was on an orbit that is 
so strange that it doesn't even fit on my screen. So I have to make move, make the screen a little bit smaller for you. This object called Sedna, um, originally 2003 VB12. Sedna is on an orbit that takes 10,000 years to go around the sun, which is which is just an astonishing amount of time. Uh, you know, I like to think of uh, that Sedna is right now coming in close to the sun, but the last time it was this close to the sun was was we were in the middle of the ice ages. Um, so it really is an extraordinarily distant orbit like this. And that's amazing. But what's actually the most amazing thing about Sedna is that it, it has an orbit that is elongated. And it, having an elongated orbit, you need something to kick you onto an elongated orbit. But Sedna never comes close to anything. If you look at this orbit here, Sedna never comes closer to Neptune. Neptune is way down in here. Sedna never comes closer to Neptune than Neptune does to the sun. Sedna is so far away that there is nothing that we know of in the solar system that can possibly interact with it to change its orbit. When we found Sedna, the, we knew immediately that there had to be something else in the solar system. And what we thought at the time, we knew it wasn't a new planet because we knew there were no new planets. Uh, people had been looking, talking about new planets for the last 200 years. And, and, and at this point, I think something like 35 previous astronomers had come up with some theory that there was a new planet to be found and all 35 were wrong and, and looked a little bit silly. And, and we knew that we were not gonna be one of those silly people saying a new planet. But what we thought was going on was that early in the history of the solar system, that uh, this object Sedna had been perturbed not by a planet down here, but maybe by a passing star that had that had come close to our solar system and sort of pulled the orbit of Sedna a little bit away from the rest of the solar system. To me, this was a very exciting prospect. This meant that Sedna was kind of a fossil record of the earliest history of the solar system. And so we sent, we spent a decade looking for more objects like Sedna. And I'd like to show you all of the orbits of these objects we found, except that we didn't find any. So um, I can't show you anything, but luckily other people did a better job and found uh, found uh, more objects like Sedna and found not just objects like Sedna, but more objects on these very elongated orbits. And what's very strange, here's Sedna again in this, in this darker purple version. Here are a couple of these other objects that we knew about um, too in about 2016. If these objects had been pulled away by a star four billion years ago, like, like I originally thought, then four billion years later, they would all be pointing in, in totally random directions, pointing around the sun, like, like um, uh, just, just randomly oriented. It's really easy to see just by looking at this, that these, these are not randomly oriented. In fact, they look like they are all kind of pointing roughly in one direction. And the first thing you should think when you see that is, wow, you know, a planet could do that um, because a planet would still be there actively pulling things in one direction. They wouldn't have time to go apart. And this is this is the time when when I, I went down to my, my colleague's office just down the hall, um, Constantine Batigan, and I, I showed him these data. I'm like, Constantine, these things are all lined up like this. Um, and he said, well, could be a planet, but we both know that's dumb because there aren't any planets out there to be found. And we don't want to be the 36th and 37th astronomers saying that there's a planet out there and be wrong. Um, so we laughed and tried to do some calculations, trying to figure out how else you can have these objects lined up like this. That's not a planet because we knew a planet was dumb. And we spent a full year trying all sorts of different um, mechanisms that would try to line these things up. And, and it was very frustrating because we, we couldn't come up with anything. We, we felt like we were failures. We, we failed to come up with a mechanism to explain these data. And so we thought, you know, maybe we should think a little bit about how a planet would work. And we, we thought about it and did some math and, and thought that a planet, if you had a planet with an orbit like this, all the way around these, it would kind of be hugging all of these objects and preventing them from escaping. And so we're like, well, the math works. Let's 
let's try a computer simulation and see, see if it really works out the way we think it does. And um, I'm gonna show you this computer simulation and I'm gonna show it. So I'm gonna walk you through it first, which is this, this line, you'll see it better here in a little bit. This pink line is the orbit of a planet. You won't see the orbit, the planet itself. The planet is going around many, many, many times. You just see the orbit. These blue oval, ovals are the orbit of a bunch of what we would call test particles, um, basically Kuiper belt objects on very extended orbits that we put down, we just place them down at the beginning of the solar system. And this very faint circle you can barely see, that's the orbit of Neptune. So we're looking at a huge uh, zoomed out view of the solar system. And, we, and what I want you to do is watch the evolution of these blue things. So here we go, it's a 4 billion year simulation. I hope you have enough time to watch. Um, okay, we're not gonna, we're gonna do it a little bit sped up. So what do you see? The first thing you see is that many of those objects that started are gone. This is what people talk about when they say uh, a planet clears its orbit. You just saw that process of clearing the orbit very clearly. What you also see is that inside of about here, this is, this is the closest that this planet gets uh, um, right here. We would call it the perihelion. Things that are inside the perihelion are not really affected. You see them going around it's kind of like a clock, anti-clockwise direction. That's the precession of the orbits um, that, that randomizes them. So they're not affected, but what we're looking for are these very distant objects. We wanna see the ones that get captured over here on this side. So here's one that gets captured, right? No, not that one, this one. This one gets, cap this one gets captured. Uh, nope, this one, no. Maybe this one, no. This one, no. Okay, bad news. None of them get captured where they're supposed to get captured. But what do they do? They actually are stuck over here instead. We actually, our first calculations got it wrong because of the a couple of the assumptions that we were making. And we thought that that, that seeing objects clustered like that meant there was a planet over a planet here, but it really means a there's a planet over here. And and with just a little bit of thought, we kind of slapped our foreheads and realized what we had been thinking wrong. It, it totally makes sense that these are the objects that live the longest um, because you know how the orbit of a planet works. The planet spends most of its time out here and then it goes fast through here like this, fast through here like this. Same as here, these spend most of their time out here and then fast through here like this. Crossing the orbit of a giant planet is bad news. A lot of the objects got ejected, but the ones that didn't get ejected didn't get ejected because they move very fast through this part of the orbit where the planet is also moving very fast through its part of the orbit. So these are the only ones that have any chance of surviving. They spend most of their time out here while this planet spends most of its time out here and they spend the, uh, they're spend they able to last for long. They still won't last forever. Eventually they'll get too close to this planet and they won't survive. But these are the ones that last the longest. So when we did these simulations and we were like, well, that that works, it's a, it's a nice simulation and it explains our data, but explaining data, I, I have to say that for astronomers and particularly for theoretical astronomers, explaining data is pretty easy. Often you can show some theoretical astronomer data and they'll come up with an explanation. If you say, oh no, no, I'm sorry, I had it upside down, it's really the opposite. They're like, oh, that's good. I have an even better explanation for that. Explanations are easy. What you really want is a theory that is powerful enough to make predictions. And then you want those predictions to come through. So this is an ex explanation, I would say, not yet a good hypothesis. But this explanation, we, we started trying to understand other things this explanation would predict. And one very important thing that it predicts is that there will be other objects in the solar system, not just clustered in this direction, but there'll be objects that are clustered in this direction and in this direction, but that their orbits will have been twisted by 90 degrees. So they'll be, they'll be perpendicular to the plane of the solar system. So it'll be, they'll be plunging in and out of the plane of the solar system and they'll be going off in this direction and in this direction. And I have to say, when we first made that prediction, I thought, oh boy, that's, that's bad news because those don't exist. 
We've never seen them. They have to exist according to our theory. So we're wrong. So we were, we were about to throw our theory out and try to figure out something else. And one day I was sitting there thinking about some of these other objects that I knew. And I realized that I had been, I had been short-sighted in what I was looking at and that there was a whole set of objects that I hadn't really considered. And, and I, I, I said to Constantine, okay, we have to look at these other objects. Maybe these are the ones we look for and I'm gonna plot them on the screen on a plot that looks just like this and we'll see where they are. We plotted them and they were perfect for our prediction. And, and I think our jaws hit the floor at this point um, that we, we the suddenly in our brains, it went from, here is a nice explanation. Isn't it kind of fun to, oh, there's a giant planet out there in the outer solar system. Let's go find it. Um, there are other predictions that have been made over the years. Um, the easiest prediction to make actually is, you know, here it is. We, these objects are clustered. Uh, these objects are clustered. It predicts that there's a planet like this. And if we if we keep finding more objects, those should be clustered too. And I'm happy to say, I mean, this that, that's a harder prediction because it takes longer, but it's been long enough now that I can tell you that the prediction has worked incredibly well. If you look at the objects and, and, and we now can actually do even a better job because we understand the physics a little better so we know which objects to be looking for. And if you look for those, you see that um, these are the original objects. The new objects that have been found are clustered still over here like this. There is one object in the opposite direction. And that's actually good because our theory only predicts that about 90% should be clustered, not 100%. And so I was getting worried before this, this one was found in the other direction. It's even, um, we, we keep on coming up with new ideas, new ways to test our theory. We, we are always willing to prove ourselves wrong. If somebody is gonna prove us wrong, we wanna prove ourselves wrong. So we, we, we continue to explore the physics of the predictions. And even just actually um, three weeks ago, uh, Constantine Batygin came up with a new realization. He's like, oh, you know what? If planet nine exists, then the objects that go inside the orbit of Neptune should be distributed like this. If planet nine doesn't exist, they should be distributed like this. Let's go look. Um, and we then go look and are ready to say, wow, we're wrong. And it turns out it's it's perfect um, for, again, once again, for planet nine. So I, I, I really, uh, based on the initial um, hypothesis and the continued uh, ability to fit the predictions and the fact that it predicts five or six different things, each of which has no other explanation. So, so suddenly you have one object that can explain all these other things in the solar system that otherwise had no explanation. I, I actually think the solar system is nearly impossible to explain without the existence of planet nine. So I, I think planet nine is, is as solid as it could possibly be without yet being found. So let me tell you what, what we know about it at this point. So first off, we know approximately how big it is. And the reason we know approximately how big it is is because we do computer simulations like the ones that, that, that I showed you, and we just simply adjust all the parameters, make it a little bigger, make it a little smaller, make it a little further away, a little closer, tilt it a little bit more, tilt it a little bit less. And our, our, our very early crude approximation said it was something like possibly 10 times the mass of the Earth. These days we know it's maybe more like six or maybe I'd even say seven times the mass of the earth. And first I wanna tell you, that's an incredibly interesting mass of a planet. If you go around the galaxy and look at all these planets that have been found around other stars, something like six times the mass of the earth is probably the single most common type of planet that we know. And yet in our solar system, until now, we had things like Neptune and Uranus that are 14 and a half, 17 times the mass of the earth and the earth, which is precisely one times the mass of the earth and nothing in between. I, I used to teach classes um, on the formation of our solar system. And I would, I would state that facts, like look around at these other extrasolar planets and there's something like six times the mass of the earth is the single most common mass. Isn't it weird that we don't have anything like that? And the answer is, it would be weird if we don't have something like that, but look at that, there it is. We actually have something that looks like the most common mass of something 
in the in the solar system, in in the in the in the galaxy. So how big is it? Um, something like six Earth masses. Well, again, let's go back to this plot. We have the terrestrial planets, we have the giant planets, we have Pluto in there, and now I've actually included a lot of the other um, Kuiper Belt objects that have been found. Some of them um, you can recognize. There's Haumea, you can recognize by its crazy shape. There's Eris, the one that's uh, significantly more massive than the one that it really is the one that that demanded that either Pluto be demoted or something else happened in the solar system and things like Maki Maki, other, other fun ones, you know. If we put planet nine on there, I just want to emphasize that this is not like slightly larger than Pluto. Let's all argue whether it's a planet or not. This is the fifth largest planet of our solar system. It's a substantial body that was formed uh, uh, around our sun. Well, we think maybe formed around our sun, um, that is that is waiting to be found out there. Okay, what else do we know about it? Well, again, with those computer simulations where we make it further away, make it closer, we've actually spent, we spent a good couple of years working hard on trying to understand where Planet Nine is to guide us on searching for it because it's you could go off to a telescope and just start blindly looking at the sky but it's a big waste of everybody's telescope time instead the right thing to do is learn as much as you can before you go mount these major surveys and here's what we've learned um i'm going to show you this map and tell you tell you what we know about it so this this is a map of the sky um looking at the whole sky and there's the celestial equator going right across here this this black line here is the ecliptic where all the planets are these two lines are the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. So inside these two lines is where all the Milky Way is, um, the, the bright stars there. And this heat map, basically, this map is a probability distribution of where to find planet nine. It's most likely in this section of the sky. This is the in the, the Northern hemisphere, nice, nice for me, uh, in the Northern hemisphere, um, but also possibly in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy, not so nice for me. And as you can tell, it's tilted compared to where the, the planets are. The planets are here in the ecliptic and planet nine is most likely tilted by about 15 degrees compared to the ecliptic. How far away it is, we can use these same simulations to figure that out. And you can see at these different points in the sky, it's in it's different distances. It's on an eccentric orbit. So if it's in this part of the sky, it's at its most distant part. This is the region of the sky where it comes to aphelion, it's most distant from the sun. This is the region of the sky where it comes to perihelion um, in, here in the Southern hemisphere. And uh, most likely it's something like five or 600 AU. AU of course is distance from the earth to the sun. 600 AU would be about 20 times the distance of Neptune. This is really, really quite far away in the solar system. And the fun plot is, is how bright it is. Um, so a lot of you are, are amateur astronomers, so you're actually used to these ideas of magnitudes. But if I, I, when I'm talking to people who don't do astronomy, I should give this plot and they look at these magnitudes and don't know anything about what they mean. But the thing to remember is that big numbers are fainter. Not surprisingly, it's fainter when it's further away. It's brighter when it's close, but it's more likely to be further away. And just for a calibration for those of you who don't spend time on telescopes, um, these magnitude things, if it's something like the very brightest, 20th magnitude, 19th magnitude, this is backyard telescopes. I, I am sure that there are people on this, this, uh, this call who have telescopes that can routinely get to 20th magnitude and could image planet nine if it's as bright as that. Um, that's in this region and through here, I'll tell you a little bit about our surveys that kind of rule this out. So I'm sorry about your, I, I just told you, you might be able to see planet nine. Now I'm gonna tell you, you probably can't, sorry. Um, but that's, that's you could see with a backyard telescope um, in this region of like 21st magnitude, there are hundreds of modest sized telescopes that could see it. In these, in these faintest regions, there are sort of tens of the largest telescopes on the planet that could possibly see it. And uh, if it's out here at 24, 25, 26, that's bad news. There are only a few of the largest telescopes and um, uh, it's harder to get those times on those very largest telescopes. So let me tell you about how you go, go about finding it. You don't, you don't start with the biggest telescope you can because the smaller the telescope, the more likely you can, you can be allowed to use it, spend a lot of time, do a big survey in the sky. So what, what we've done is we've used 
small telescopes to first look over the whole sky and see if it possibly might be bright or close. And the bad news is we haven't found it. We've now done um, three fairly substantial surveys with medium telescopes. And the, the largest one goes to about 21 and a half or 22. And there, there are only a few spots on the sky where you could still be hiding if you're as bright as 21st magnitude. Uh, 22nd magnitude. One of those spots on the sky, though, is is right here, the Southern Milky Way galaxy, right where the Southern Mil Milky Way galaxy intersects with the ecliptic in the in the constellation of uh, of Scorpius, which I'm sure um, those of you in the Philippines know and love. Still could be hiding in there. If anybody wants to go get out their telescopes, they can go to 20th magnitude and start to scan those parts of the skies. Even, even Claude Tombaugh was scared, was terrified of of having to search through the Milky Way galaxy. It's a it's a terrible place to have to look. And and we've tried, but it's really hard down and through there. I think it's not down there and as close. There are reasons to think that we would we would know for other reasons that it's out there. So what I what I think is it's in this part of the sky, this part where it's brighter than about, fainter than about 22nd, which is this part, which is this region in through here. We've actually done a pretty good survey with the Subaru telescope um, on the summit of, of uh, the big island of Hawaii, covering a lot of this region in through here. And so a lot of the parts left still to look at are these parts in the, right through the middle of the Milky Way galaxy, um, which is just about the hardest thing to imagine and, and a terrible place to have to look. Um, but we're looking, these surveys go on. I actually, I actually am, am most looking forward to um, the LSST, the Large Scale Synoptic Telescope, the Vera Rubin Observatory, that's gonna be starting observing within the next couple of years. And it is going, it's a medium sized telescope. So it's kind of gonna get to about this level, 24-ish. And its job is to scan the skies night after night after night, looking for anything that changes. And that's exactly what we need. if planet nine is within the the brightness that the Vera Rubin Observatory can get. We will find it here in the next couple of years. And I just, I just want to leave you with that thought and a, and a view of the sky where I think planet nine is right now. And it's, it's in what I think must be everybody's favorite part of the sky. And that, that is, here's the constellation of Ryan, everybody's favorite constellation um, raise your hand if it's not your constellation. I don't see any hands. It's everybody's favorite constellation. Um, and it's this wonderful spot in the sky where it's both incredibly noticeable. I think it's something that that in all in in many, if not all cultures who look at the stars, it is it is recognized as sort of this humanoid creature in in Greek mythology. here's here's a uh, here's Taurus. Uh, uh, here's here's Orion. Here's Taurus, the bull. They're in this cosmic fight in the sky and it's either either Orion has a, a shield defending himself from the bull or it's an arrow shooting at the bull. I like to think of the shield. He's not trying to kill the bull. That seems kind of mean. Um, but the path of planet nine goes straight through the middle of this cosmic battleground. And, and this is the region of the sky where we have already surveyed. So I, it's not right in the middle of their cosmic battle, but it really, it's, it's here you can see where the stars start to get more dense up here in the constellation um, Gemini, where the Milky Way galaxy is, and this is this is where I think it is. And I I I I, I like to make this to my even to myself, not just be abstract mathematical computer model survey blah blah. I I like to look up in the sky whenever I see the constellation of Orion, and I, and I can tell you it's it's starting to rise right here out my window. Um, um, tonight, as as the sun has just gone down a couple hours ago, it's starting to rise, and it's there. I want you to go out tomorrow night and go find Orion and and look at the spot between Orion and Taurus and up towards the Milky Way, and just think about it. This is this is probably where the ninth planet, the fifth largest planet in our solar system, um, the first planet found in in nearly two hundred years. This is probably where it's hiding in the sky. And I think we will be finding it in, in the next couple of years, probably with this, uh, with this LSST, with the Vera Rubin Observatory. If not, that will redouble the search with some larger telescopes. And I just, I just want to end this with um, the slide that I showed you 
at the very beginning, which 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 I was told nobody will recognize. I hope somebody does. This is this is a poster stolen from the poster for the the famous movie Plan Nine from Outer Space from about nineteen. 19- 59 which somebody on here will have will recognize and it is it is a famous movie for the reason that um it is it is famously was voted this is not a joke voted as the worst movie ever made and it was it was um it is really terrible if you try to watch it i recommend trying to watch it just to see how much you can get through you can actually watch the entire thing on wikipedia and read about the worst movie ever made it is it was a directed by ed wood who's a famous american director who also directed some very good movies but this one is terrible it's got vampira as a as a vampire i guess that's what she does there's uh this is uh bella lugosi the last the last movie bella lugosi was ever in um he had passed away already and they they found footage and, and put him in it and it was you know like sort of creepy early version of ai footage of somebody and it's just a terrible terrible movie but the most terrible part of it is the graveyard scene where they're they're digging up the zombies that might be aliens I can't even remember. It's so hard to watch. But this graveyard scene, I want you to remember, this is 1959. Ed Wood was a genius. Um, Pluto itself had just been discovered 20 years earlier. But but Ed Wood, if you zoom in on the, the graveyard scene, even Ed Wood knew that something was wrong with Pluto. And this is this is what they were burying um, Pluto back there in, in 1959. Um, so with that, I want to thank uh, everybody for coming. It's it's uh, it's great to see so many so many people there in the in the participant list, and I am delighted to take questions from people. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. Wow, that's a, a lot to absorb for us amateurs. But uh, thank you so much for that very informative lecture. And uh, I'll just share my slide again. So actually, uh, we have loads of questions already, from even from some very familiar names uh, regarding the presentation, and I will try to answer them. And I'll read them to you uh, uh, from the earliest one. And this is the I think the first question is from Alan Huang, and uh, the question is. Does an amateur have any chance of detecting Planet Nine with a telescope and so software like searching for asteroids? And what part of the sky to search? I think you you answered this uh, already with you. With yeah. The, so with I, the... I I I I I I think at this stage, um, we have ruled out, as I said, nearly all the places that would be accessible to amateurs, <laughs> but. But if you have a telescope, a, a telescope that can get to 20th magnitude, and you have a pretty big field of view, um, and you want to do the Southern Milky Way galaxy, uh, which will be a just a terrible task, I would say you have about two years before LSST puts you out of business. So um, I would say have at it. You can you can read read my papers. We 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 ha we have. We are very open about where to look. You can go look at the papers we published and they 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 show you that map. We call it the treasure map of exactly where to go look in the sky. So um, have at it. That would be great. If somebody, if a, a, an amateur found it, that would be just the best thing. That'd be cool. Thank you. Uh, one of the, uh, I don't know if you know, Mr. Terry White has, well, I think uh, a lot of questions here and I'll read some of them here first. Uh, one, the first one is a comment, uh, I, I think you, you mentioned this already. To the moderator, the introduction of this seminar needs to also recognize Konstantin Batijin's uh, seminal contribution to the Planet Nine hypothesis. I think you also mentioned that. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Const so Constantine, um, he he and I are a great team. Um, he does the things I can't do, and I do the things he can't do, and the two of us together, I I think um, neither one of us could do it without the other one. So it's it's been great. And uh, another, uh, okay, there are several questions by, by, by Terry, but uh, I will just uh, uh, mention them in order of uh, how it was uh, written here. And the second one is, how do you propose to find Planet Nine if it's in front of the galactic plane where stellar crowding, crowding makes resolving Planet Nine impossible? So, so it's not impossible. That's, that's the reason. It's, it's because it's hard, but not impossible. The nice thing is that Planet Nine moves. So re, no matter what, it will at some point be in a spot where it's not 
um, against the background stars. There, there, there are always gaps between the background stars somewhere, and it will eventually be there enough times that we will notice it. We've actually um, demonstrated this with finding uh, finding asteroids and Kuiper Belt objects through the middle of the galactic plane by using enough observations. So we will be able to. It just means that we have to use 10 times more observations than we would otherwise. So it's a pain, but, um, but we'll get there eventually, painfully. Thank you. And uh, from another uh, attendee, uh, Mr. David Hazen Owen, uh, in the story about Neptune's discovery by Olivier, Olivier, I noticed that you did not mention John Couch, Couch Adams, independent efforts. Most sources cite both uh, Leverrier and Adams as independently predicting its position. Do you have a reason for focusing on Leverrier uh, exclusively? Yeah, I, so for me, it was a, the, so, so, so it is true. So the, there was a, John Couch Adams was working in, um, in England at the same time Leverrier was working in France. And there are all sort of like, France and England hated each other at this point. So there was all sorts of bad uh, back and forth um, discussion of who really deserves the credit for it. For me, the Verrier made the prediction that was given to the astronomers who found it. And, you know, saying that you independently predicted it, but without having somebody go out and find it, I, you know, I, 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 I give the credit to Le Verrier and that's, you, there, there are historians argue back and forth about who deserves it or who doesn't, but the person who led to the discovery of Neptune, I think it's fair to say is the very end. Thank you. Uh, uh, one of the, uh, the again, a uh, question from uh, Mr. Terry White. Uh, uh, at the moment, we have 10 to 11 detached ETNOs. So that's ex extreme transneptunian objects, right? ETNOs. Yeah, yeah so those, those, those objects. Yeah. yeah. That supports so the, the planet nine hypothesis. Assuming a direct detection of planet nine eludes us, eludes us. How many more stable detached ETNOs with well-known orbit, orbits must be discovered before we can have incontrovertible indirect evidence that planet nine must exist? So, so it's a good question. So, so I showed you that picture, which was about a dozen of those objects all in one direction, and you know, the question is, how, how many would you need to find to just really cemented that there there must be planet nine it's an interesting question because i would say statistically we're done um we have we, we, finding more will not improve the statistics any more than we have now um i would say that that there you will never have incontrovertible evidence that planet nine must exist until you see planet nine I, until you see it there will always be enough wonder if there's just something that we're missing. I don't think there is. I think we have, it's not just those objects that are in that direction. It's the five or six or other things that are predicted. To me, Ed is as, as good as an evidence as we'll ever get. But until the day I see it, and until the day everybody else sees it, the evidence, it, it will be a really good hypothesis, but not incontrovertible evidence. Thank you. Uh, I think this uh, next question was also answered in one of your slides from Shakila Ramasami. How long does it take for planet nine to orbit around the sun? Uh, was this what was this prediction uh, or something? Uh, oh, so no, I, I actually didn't mention that. I, it might have been on my slide, but I didn't say the number. So it's you it's, mentioned something like ten to twenty thousand Earth years. So so yeah, I think that's what the slide said. I think I think these days we think it's 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 actually in a very similar orbit to that first object I talked about, Sedna, except it's on the other side. Um, so it takes about ten thousand years to go around the sun. The good news is. Probably it's at its most distant right now and it's most faintest, faintest. But if you can wait till it's its closest, which is 5,000 years, it's gonna be really bright. All of us will be able to observe it with our with our backyard telescopes in 5,000 years. So I'm gonna have a party here at my house. Everybody's invited, bring your telescope. We'll look at planet nine. Actually, we won't because it'll be in the Southern hemisphere. So we're having a party at your house and we're gonna look at it there. Thank you. Uh, here's the next question from Bruce Kamiak, uh, if a passing star had pulled objects into a more elongated orbit, 
wouldn't those orbits be elongated toward that star? It would have passed on one side of the solar system, so those elongated orbits would all be oriented in that direction. Would that not be so? Yeah, so it, it, is, it is basically true. They would all be pulled in one direction by the star. What then happens, if you remember those computer simulations and you saw all the orb objects that were close to the sun, closer to the sun, and were, were moving around um, uh, in this thing I called precession, all of the objects would, that were originally in one direction over time precess in the same way and they would have been randomized so they wouldn't be all in one direction. So the only way to keep them all in one direction is to have something happening right now. Thank you. Uh, another technical question from Mr. Terry White. I, I, can I can I request I like there's there, there are a lot of questions and so I'm happy to answer the technical questions. But let's uh, uh, let's go for some new questions yeah. Yeah. from new people, okay. and then I'll get back to them if there's time. Uh, here you one went from Roman Tolosnikov. Tolo, Tolo, what were the objects in the orbits that are 90 degrees away from the clustered objects? The, the, they're, they're objects. They're similar types of objects. They're just in a... Um, uh, they're just on different orbits. They're, they... they <laughs> The reason that, that my brain did not think of them at first is because they don't they they have different names to different people. Some people call them part of the Kuiper belt. Some people call them centaurs. Some people call them scatter disk. Um, it, it's all very complicated, and nobody quite knows what to call them. But they're but they're but they're other icy objects like these same ones. And here is a a question from another familiar name. Uh, Dr. Dan Green, why do you use the term Kuiper belt but everything for everything beyond Neptune, even when there's no obvious belt away beyond 40 astronomical units? We don't call Apollo-type objects part of the main asteroid belt. Um, honestly, because I don't really think it makes that much of there's a, there's a Kuiper belt out there. These objects go in and out of the Kuiper belt, so we call so actually, I mean, there's, there is a good answer to that, which is that we don't call Apollo-type objects part of the main asteroid belt because we call them asteroids. Interestingly, we don't have a good name for these icy objects beyond Neptune. We originally called them Kuiper belt objects, um, and <laughs> which would be the, the equivalent name for asteroids. So, so awkwardly, I call it a Kuiper belt because they're Kuiper belt objects. These objects that go beyond, they're, they're physically the same thing. So to me, it's awkward to like give them a different name. They're, they're all still, Kuiper belt objects, because to me that's a physical thing as opposed to a dynamical thing. But it's a good question. I mean, we don't, I don't think we have good names for these things, and maybe we'll someday have good names. But it'd be nice to have a good name for these objects that are these icy objects beyond Neptune, which are not all beyond, some people call them trans Neptunium objects, and then they weirdly include objects that go inside of Neptune, which is also dumb. So the the, the terminology out there is is a big mess. I will, I will absolutely admit that. That is something for IAU too. <laughs> God no, any anybody but the IAU. Don't don't get them involved. Uh, okay. <laughs> now from Avery Ogata, what effects may P9 have on giant planet migration models, if any? Interestingly, um, so so planet nine is so th so are these these uh, hypotheses that are that are quite um, popular these days that I that that I think are are probably very good description of reality that early in the history of the solar system, all the planets moved around. And in particular, the, the whole, the giant planets were packed in closer together and that uh, they started to spread apart. And even um, Jupiter and Saturn, something happened to Jupiter and Saturn that, that led to gigantic kind of explosion of objects, Uranus and Neptune getting scattered further out. It is entirely possible that this is where Planet Nine came from. This is actually, I think, one of the best hypotheses of where Planet Nine came from. Planet Nine is too small to have affected the migration. That was mostly Jupiter and Saturn. Even Uranus and Neptune are too small to mostly have affected it. But it was big enough to have been part of it. And then it probably, I think, Planet Nine got too close to probably Uranus or Neptune in this period, and then ejected out to the edge of the solar system where it's been lurking ever since then, is my guess. Thank you. Again, again I think this is another question from an amateur astrophotographer. Jerry Hilburn, 
what is the maximum apparent magnitude looking up from Earth at reposition? Opposition? Uh, opposition, yeah. Could, be, uh, yeah. could this be detected with an amateur imaging frame for an 11-inch telescope running a highly quantum-efficient uh, camera or sensor? Yeah, again, if Planet 9 were as big and as close as it could be, and if you could get to 20th magnitude, you could see it. And I think, the, so the answer is yes, I think you could see it with that type of telescope. I don't think that's gonna be true. I think it's gonna end up being 23rd, 24th magnitude. And that's that's beyond all but people with really serious amateur telescopes. And related to this is a question by David Hasenyawa again. Uh, in terms of magnitude, how deep does the Zwicky transient facility reach? Could yeah, it so potentially like planet nine? So Zwicky, Zwicky Transient Facility is a, is a big survey that's happening at Palomar Observatory, just a little bit south of me right here. Um, and it does, just like what I talked about with the, the LSST, it goes um, night after night after night after night, taking pictures of the sky, looking for things to remove. Great idea, um, but it's a small telescope. And so it's actually the same telescope that we used to discover Eris and Quarwar and Sedna. And we have, in fact, searched through all that data. If it... It it was it was the first one we used to sort of cut off that bottom bottom edge, and we didn't find it there. Thank you. Uh, apparently, we have a lot of uh, 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 interested uh, uh, professional astronomers here who are asking questions. Sir. And this is a question by Kay Lee. Uh, since twenty twenty, Scott Shepard. And the Dark Energy Survey announced the discovery of a handful of new extreme TNOs like 2021 RR205 and 2019 EUS, whose orbits reach 2,000 astronomical units at aphelion and are not part of the Planet 9 clustering. How do these new ETNOs fit in with your hypothesis, and what implication does their non-clustering have on Planet 9's existence? Yeah, so it's so so the, the the question basically is if if you look at so I showed you the the plot of all the things that are that are being affected by Planet Nine, if you instead looked at a plot of every object known in the outer solar system and things on very extreme orbits, it would be a lot messier, and it's a lot messier because um, it, it's mostly it, it's a fault of two things: it's a fault of Neptune, and the fault of the the basically the galactic tides that are that are making comets also the the forces from planet nine are exceedingly weak because it's very far away um it's it's it barely keeps those objects clustered together and if you if you knock those objects with any other force you'll knock them out of alignment and the easiest way to knock them with any other force is to have them get a little bit too close to neptune so any object even if it's on a very elongated orbit, if during its orbit it it comes within uh, seven or eight AU of the orbit of Neptune, it will not be aligned the way that it's supposed to be aligned. You have to be protected from Neptune, but you also have to be protected from the galactic tides. You can't. You have to be far away from Neptune, but you can't be so far away on your outer part of your orbit that you are basically um, being pulled around by the entire. Milky Way galaxy. So there's this, this sweet spot. This is this is one of the things that's taken us, you know, it's we we have continued to study and learn more about the physics of how Planet Nine works, because otherwise you if you if you pure, purely were just looking for things clustered, you would say, oh well, I guess it's not there anymore, and you'd give up and go somewhere else. But if you look for the right objects, if you say, I'm only gonna I'm gonna look for all the objects that are should be affected by Planet Nine and throw away the other ones. Then you realize that it's a that it's quite a strong signal. But this is this is something that's hard to notice unless you're paying close attention to to the to the physics of what's going on. Thank you. Uh, here's another question from Jerry Hilburn: How many KBOs like Sedna are estimated to lie beyond its orbit? I don't know the most recent estimate. I'm sorry to say, um, it's a good question, and I. I have we 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 wrote a paper on this a decade ago, and now I don't I don't remember. Um, embarrassing, um, a lot is the answer. And from David Shepard, any possibility Planet Nine be more black hole? 
But so, so this is, I mean, as crazy as that idea sounds, because it's crazy. Uh, it has been it, more than one paper has been published suggesting it might be a black hole. And, and the reason why is because plant, right. The reason we know planet nine exists is because we see its gravity. We see the effects of its gravity. We don't see planet nine. We don't see the effects of its atmosphere or anything else. And so we know it's six or seven earth masses, but it, it could be a six or seven earth mass black hole. It could be a six or seven earth mass cat. It could be pretty much anything that six or seven earth masses out there. Um, so the real question to ask is, does it make any sense whatsoever for it to be a primordial black hole or a small black hole? And the answer is absolutely not. It, having a planet out there is a just an utterly reasonable thing. We see planets like planet nine around other stars. Um, uh, we have never seen black holes of that size. So it's it, there, there's kind of no reason to invoke the idea of a black hole. Um, though I can't say it's not. So so maybe I'll be proved wrong and it's actually a black hole. That would be crazy. But but as far as we know, there's no reason to think it's a black hole. Thank you. Uh, here's a question from our from one of our uh, members uh, from Christopher Louis Lou. Uh, will the James Webb Space Telescope be involved in the search for planet nine? So James Webb Space Telescope is fantastic for so many things, but the one thing it's no good at at all is searching the sky for, for something. It doesn't take pictures over a very wide field of view. It looks at a tiny, 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 tiny little patch. When we find Planet Nine, JWST will be fantastic for studying its atmosphere, for studying what it's made out of, maybe for looking at moons. But until we find it, um, we're, we're stuck with these telescopes that, that we have on the ground, which have big, huge cameras with big fields of view. Thank you. Question from Scott Lutz. What is your prediction of the average angular motion? Uh, so, so right now, if, you, if you're looking at it opposition, it will move a couple of arc seconds from one night to the next, which is actually a really nice speed. That means if you take a picture one night, you take a picture the next night, you very easily see it move and you see it move uh, very obviously. Thank you. From Pearl Andrea Namok, would computer simulations change as our understanding of planet formation changes? If yes, would that change anything about your observations? A question about computer simulations. Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, we we continue to update our understanding of of the effects of Planet Nine and and what we should be looking for, um, and as we understand how it got there and how the other objects get there, and we have continued to update our simulations and and we are even now we're we're thinking hard about how all the time we're trying to think about how we could possibly be wrong and what we need to do to 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 rethink where to look or whether to look. And so far, we still are pretty convinced that it's in the area that we say, but uh, we are, we're always trying harder. Thank you. From Dante de Jesus, uh, would Planet 9 be a gas planet or not? Um, I think yes, but I don't know. We, we think it's gonna be more like a miniature version of Neptune than a large version of the Earth, for example. And the reason we think that is because when we look at planets around other stars, that tends to be what we see. That said, we've been surprised so many times when we look at other planets. So I think it's gonna be a gas giant. If it turns out to be something else, I will be surprised, but maybe not that surprised. Thank you. Uh, this is from Victor Gabriel. Andres Tolentino, I guess he has not read your book yet. How were you able to discover the planet Eris? Um, sadly, it's not a planet. We'll start with that. Um, yeah. But uh, but this was this was a, a the, the sh very short answer because that's a very long. The answer to that is a very long question that you can you can <laughs> you can read all about in my book. There's 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 my self promotion answer. Um, but it's but it's uh, basically the simple answer is you take a picture of the sky and you come back and take another picture of the sky and you find something that moves. And the trick is just to have a telescope and a camera that can cover huge swaths of the sky at once. And so this is what we did back almost 20 years ago now, more than 20 years ago now. Um, 
being kind of the first astronomers able to use these digital cameras to look at huge, huge swaths of the sky. Thank you. From Again, from Michael Green, uh, you showed the Sedna-like orbit superimposed on planet X's orbit. If you know the orbits of the Sedna-like, uh, would the time that they are at perihelion tell you that planet X would be at uphill? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wish that would be that would be incredible if it were true. And the answer is no. We have we tried so hard to see if we could use the positions of the objects to predict where planet nine is. And we have now proven to ourselves that you can't do it, sadly. So this is why we are less good th than Leverrier. Leverrier not only predicted Neptune, but he pointed at it. We can predict the orbit of planet nine and the path through the sky, but we can't tell you where it is. So we, we will never get our names engraved in the Eiffel Tower, I suspect. <laughs> This is from Christine Atienza. What's the most bizarre simulations predictions that you've done or seen before using Planet Nine in the simulations? You know, it's fun. If you if you make Planet Nine too massive, it destroys the entire Kuiper belt, which is kind of fun, um, and makes these weird structures that we've never seen. So there's there's all kinds of strange things that can happen if you if you do these things. So, so I, I, I have to warn you that I, I have a, um, a hard limit in about 10 more minutes where I have a, a, another um, meeting that I have to go to. Um, okay. <laughs> so so um, Maybe we will be just sending the questions. Uh, we will just be sending the questions to you by email. Uh, uh, and then we'll try to answer the, the, the ones. Yeah, so I see there's, a, yeah, there's a lot of questions. I'm sorry, it doesn't yeah, look like we're gonna yeah, get to right. all of these, but I'm happy to, I'm happy to no, answer. Okay. Happy to, am questions. happy to answer all of them. Yeah, yeah. So I think some of them have been answered. Well, this is an interesting, interesting question from one of our members again, Raymond Ang. Can amateurs assist in locating Planet Nine by observing if there are possible perturbations caused by Planet Nine on magnitude fifteen or eighteen asteroids or comets? No, sadly, those are those objects are too close. So those those are going to be inside the orbit of Jupiter, and uh, it's, it's it's a great question. Cause, and we've we've tried to work out the physics of that too. And it turns out that the perturbations that you get are of the order of meters in in the orbit, and so that's just way too small for even uh, for any telescopes to be able to measure. Maybe last uh, maybe last. Uh... Uh, three three questions. Uh, I'm going to it. Uh, well, have they been answered? Uh, what is the proper motion? Uh, this is from Kenneth Great. What what would be the proper motion B of Planet Nine if it if in the part of the sky you believe it is? Uh, yeah. So I think this is what what we just said. If it's if it's where we think it is, and you look at opposition, which is which is right around now. So you know if you look up, we're close to Orion. It's kind of straight overhead. At the opposition now, <clears throat> if you look right around now, it, it moves by about one arc second um, per night. One, one or two, depending on exact cloud it is. Uh, this is a comment from Dan Green. Transneptunian objects is a good term. Centaurs can be used for objects crossing the orbit of Neptune. Uh, there should be any significant objects. Yeah, I don't I mean, I, I get your point. Yeah. The nomenclature is terrible. Like some things barely. So, so is Pluto a centaur because it crosses the orbit of of Neptune instead of a trans-Neptunian object? Like it's 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 trans-Neptunian is terrible. Um, Kuiper belt. I take I take the point that Kuiper belt is equally terrible. Something possibly needs to be done, but it's not trans-Neptunian. That's a terrible term, particularly because a lot of them aren't. <laughs> uh, last two questions from Glenn Wallace. Given the potential distance and magnitude of Planet Nine, where it may currently be in its elongated orbit, so it's finding Planet Nine using occultations, uh, another option versus directly imaging and discovering it. Yeah, as as occultations will be spectacular when we find Planet Nine, particularly if it really is in the Milky Way galaxy. There'll be occultations all the time, and they'll be incredibly slow because it's moving so slowly. They'll be We'll learn so much about the atmosphere. As a way to find it, though, it's pretty much impossible to, to use that to discover it. You, 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 
you would have to be looking at all the stars all the time, looking for one, making a little dip in its light curve once. So it's kind of like, you know, what Kepler and Tess do all the time, but it's even worse. So it's just, it's kind of impossible. But man, I'm really looking forward to those occultations um, when Planet Nine is really found. Last question. Uh, the potential Planet Nine may have originated there or was scattered during planetary migration? So I, I think the answer is that it was scattered during planet migration, but but that's just a hypothesis. We don't, you know, the, the, the Planet Nine hypothesis doesn't require us to know how it got there. It just requires there to be a gravitational pull. And, and scattering makes a lot of sense. It's not impossible to form there, though I think it's unlikely. It's not even impossible for it to have been captured um, around by, from another star, which again, unlikely. But one of the things I'm looking forward to, it, discovering it is gonna be exciting, studying it once we find it to learn how it got there and what it's made of and everything else is where the real science comes in that I'm, that I'm most looking forward to. Thank you. That was from Michael Evangelista Santana. And there's a comment here from Eileen Wang. Thank you, Edwin and Imelda, for arranging this talk. And thank you, of course, to, uh, to Mike so much for, 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 for agreeing to give this talk and answer the questions very graciously. So uh, maybe I'll end the, the Q&A and then just try to send the rest of the questions uh, in the interest of time. And uh, Imelda, uh, Edwin, do you have uh, comments before we uh, yeah uh, just a very quick question uh, Mike and it's kind of lighthearted um, <laughs> why were the names Sina and Gabriel not adopted by the IAU so whenever we found objects in our early Kuiper belt searches or for the big Kuiper belt objects we gave them we gave them code names um, so that we would when we were talking about them so that we we could keep track of what we were talking about <clears throat> that we we never intended to be the real names um, and so when when we found Haumea we called it Santa because it was found three days after Christmas um, when we found uh, uh, what what's now Maki Maki it was Easter Bunny because it was found right after Easter seems to be a pattern here <laughs> but when we found a what is now Eris. I had been saving the name, that code name Xena um, for the biggest thing we found, X kind of for planet X, Xena wow. because it has that sort of Greek mythology, even though it's only TV mythology rather than real mythology name to it. And so that was just our, our, our sort of funny to ourselves code name. And I, I love the name and it would have actually been a kind of a funny name, but it uh, I'm pretty sure it would never have been accepted by the very stodgy International Astronomical <laughs> Union, um, who probably doesn't want to name things after TV characters rather than proper mythology. All proper mythology is is old, not not new. I think, but Zena and her sidekick um, Gabrielle, uh, I think, are are now happy being um, heiress and Dysnomia. Um, Lucy Lawless, who played Zena on the TV show called me up and, and said she was delighted that it was originally Xena <laughs> and, and is also delighted that Dysonomia the moon is the demon spirit of lawlessness, which uh, another inadvertent callback to her. So I, I think they're, they're, they're happy to have been included um, even for a little bit. Great. Thank you so much, Mike, for, uh, you know, for sharing your very precious time with us. We really You're very welcome, it. and and I say I love these questions, and I'm I'm happy to try to answer uh, a lot more of them as time goes on. Maybe not immediately, <laughs> so be patient. <laughs> I I'm, I will take note of them and try to send them. So maybe Mike uh, will, thank you we'll so have much you again. again in the yeah. future. <laughs> Once I find it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so or much. Or somebody uh, finds it. Somebody yeah. else may find it. Doesn't have to be me. We'll have a party. Yeah. yeah. Before we let you go, uh, Mike, uh, can uh, allow us to to acknowledge uh, uh, your talk uh, to present with, by presenting our uh, ALP certificate of appreciation. Uh, this is certification uh, from the Astronomical League of the Philippines. Uh, reads that uh, this is presented to Dr. Michael E. Brown for his invaluable insights, experiences, and expertise shared with the participants of the online talk entitled "The Search for Planet Nine." Held as part of the ALP Astronomy Expertise 2024, given the 20th day of January 2024, 
signed by our president, Mr. James Seventy, and yours truly, uh, Dr. Stephen Cruz Aguilar, Vice President. And uh, before we let you go, can we have a group picture? I don't know. How do we do that? Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, Peter, can you make a backup as well? Okay. Uh, Imelda, Edwin, can you get closer a little? Edwin. Yeah, Edwin, going. Yeah, yeah. A little more to the right. Your right. Yeah, that's it. Okay. A little more. A little more. To the side. Okay. One, two, three. One more. One. Two, three. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for uh, joining our, uh, being our best uh, lecturer right now for it, on Planet it was, Nine. It was it was my pleasure. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We uh, we know you Thank have you. to go. Thank you. Okay. okay. All right. Thank okay. you, Mike. Bye. Thank you very Bye -bye. much. Bye. Hi, Mike. So uh, before we conclude today's webinar, I would like to thank again all our attendees for joining us. And we will be sending your certificate of attendance for today's webinar by email. Uh, and this, uh, and like uh, 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 Ms. Dr. Ms. Joson mentioned, this is our 22nd uh, uh, series, uh, uh, 22nd talk. And for those who miss all our previous ALP Astronomy Expert Speaker Series, you can view the video recordings, uh, including this one, of all our past webinars at the official ALP YouTube channel. Yeah. Just search uh, Astronomical League of the Philippines in YouTube and uh, you'll be able to access all the previous uh, lectures on this one as well. And here are the next speakers for our ALP Astronomy Expert Speaker Series. Uh, Dr. Meg Yuri a professor of physics and astronomy at Yale University. And she will be talking about, uh, possibly, yeah, uh, this has to be confirmed, the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And after this, our next speaker will be Dr. Michael uh, Kelly, who is a program scientist of the Planetary Defense Coordination Office at NASA headquarters and an astrophysicist at Yale University. He will uh, probably be talking on the topic, defending Earth from asteroid impacts. So please wait for the dates and the further announcements by visiting our social media page and our ALP webpage at astroleaguefields.org and our Facebook page. So thank you everyone for attending and being patient. Uh, for those who were, questions were not answered, we will try to email them to you uh, once uh, we get a response from uh, our speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Mike Brown. Dr. Mike Brown. Thank you, everyone. And uh, for the panelists, we, we I will send the Zoom link for our post webinar meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all our attendees. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Have a nice day.